We are certainly in a unique day, there is no doubt about that, and, uh, and, and we are called to a unique purpose, church, and, and I really believe that what God is doing and stirring in our hearts right now, and, and through praise and this worship and this time we just get with God, and I just feel like he's getting ready to, um, I feel like he's getting ready to break some things free, and really break things loose in his presence, um, but at the same time, I want you to know that that's going to require things of us as, as his followers. Um, and, and we'll get a little bit to that in a minute. I do want to touch a, a few things. Um, uh, if you don't know me, my name's Luke Cleaver. Um, my wife and I, we um, are lovers of this church, I guess, if you want to say it like that. We love being a part of this body. And uh, we are also supported by your missions giving. Uh, we direct Royal Family Kids Camp and Miriam's Hope. Um, and I just want to thank you guys for your support. I don't know if you hear enough uh, from us, at least, that your uh, offerings, uh, your donations, when they come to us, uh, we are so thankful. Uh, uh, Lifehouse is a monthly giver to what we do, and that's through your offerings. It's only because you guys give. So thank you very much for that. We don't exist without you guys doing that. So a few things. I do want to give you a quick update on what's going on in the ministries before we get into, into the Word. Um, as far as Royal Family Kids Camp is concerned, uh, we're just basically in preparation mode for next year, uh, getting things ready. When January hits, we'll start recruiting individuals to come again and help. And I'm looking at the Lucas Savages because they will be helping this year, uh, whether that's in chains or not. Hallelujah. Paul said, I'm in chains. And uh, we're, we're going to make sure that they're out there. Um, we had a great crew last year. Um, we had compliments from uh, the camp, uh, uh, the people who run the campground. They thought... It was amazing, and uh, most of our recruits were from here. So um, it, it certainly bespeaks what we're about here at Lifehouse as well as going out into the community. Um, we are having, I do want to give you a quick uh, notification, we're having a um, dessert auction here on October 1st, which is a Sunday evening. And how we're doing that is we're giving away tables. We have about four tables left. If you're interested in grabbing a table for that, uh, that'll be eight people that would be at your table. There's no cost to attend. We're going to feed you for nothing. So mark that down. That never happens. Then we're going to fleece you. Okay, after we fatten you up, we're going to fleece you. You know, we're good, we're good farmers that way. Um, and uh, so we're going to auction off desserts at the end of the night. So if you're interested in coming, uh, it, it, we're not, it's not going to be a big programming thing. We're not having a big speaker or anything like that. We're just going to uh, enjoy God's presence and enjoy fellowship and we all know what we're coming for. We're coming to finance kids going to camp uh, for a week in the summer. So if that's something you're interested in, you've got to talk to me. We've, we actually didn't bring tickets today. I apologize. But if you want a table, we'll mark you down and, and give you all the information. Uh, Karina's in the nursery if you want to talk to her or, or me after, after service. Again, that's October 1st here at, here at the church. As far as Miriam's Hope is concerned, um, we, uh, we've had a recent addition. One of our own, Dan Kosman, is now uh, working for us part-time. He's our site manager. Yeah. Amen. So um, he's, he's running day-to-day -day stuff for us so that uh, we can get in front and begin to cast more vision. We're looking to expand. We're looking to grow the ministry. We're looking to see what God has next for us. Um, so I come to you with two requests um, as, as a ministry. One is we are looking, we're always looking for, uh, we're, we call them friends of hope. And what friends of hope do is they come alongside of our families and they're just there for support. Uh, they're there when, when there's a need. They just reach out to them. Uh, we, we like to have a weekly contact with, with our families. So if that's something you feel like God's calling you to, a discipleship in a different way, uh, then please uh, let us know. We have applications, very short, very easy to fill out. We have a sign-up sheet in the back. I actually put one at the information desk. If that's something you might be interested in, fill that out, and uh, we'll reach out to you and, and, and see your interest level in that. So that is one need that we always have. Um, another need we have is finances, guys. I'm just being really honest with you. You're my body. You're my, uh, th this is my family. Um, you know, when, when you run a ministry and you're, you're, you're doing all the day-to-day -day stuff and then, and then you're also casting vision, it can get quite overwhelming, which is why we brought Dan on so it could free me up to go and um, cast more vision and get more um, funding for the ministry. So if you feel like God's leading you in your heart to give above and beyond um, that which you're giving to be fed here, uh, we would really appreciate that. We're always, uh, you know, we don't, we don't live off a huge budget. Um, we, uh, we, we are on a shoestring budget. But we don't take any money from the state. That allows us to preach Christ, you guys. And we believe that is primary when it comes to converting souls. 
You are not going to convert them with a social program. I don't care what the state props up. I'm here to tell you it's time God's people took control of this thing, went into the throne room, grabbed the horns of the altar, and began to call it what it is. And we really need to take ownership of this. And, and so if you feel like God's calling you to maybe give, we would, we would sure appreciate that. You can write that to LifeHouse, put Miriam's Hope in the memo, if that's on your heart. That's all I'm going to say about that. Let's get into the word here. Uh, let's pray real quick before we start. Father God, Lord, I just, uh, I can't do this without your spirit. Father, I need you in this moment, Lord. Use the words you have chosen. Let this not be about us. Let it not be about the flesh, Lord, but let your spirit consume us and dwell in this place, Father God. Fill this tabernacle. Fill it with your glory today, Lord. Pierce our hearts. Change us, Lord. Let's not worry about the time. Let's not worry about what's going on uh, in, in the natural realm, Father. But let today, let us be caught up in your holy presence, Father God. Bless this word, Lord, for we're handling a sword that can cut both ways. And I just pray, Lord, that you would give, uh, give me prudence and wisdom as I deliver a word that is as precious as this, Lord, because I, I have complete respect and honor for this word that you've given us. Be with us today, Lord. Amen. Okay. All right. So, so I did the black background. Okay, I wanted to remove all distraction. Brian had all the visuals and everything, and that's, I can't do that. I, you should see me. I would have like word art where it like gets bubbly big and then kind of comes around, and nobody likes to see that. So I did it the most basic as possible, okay? Times New Roman, black background, there you go. Real <laughs> fancy. Um, I got this idea from a, uh, Sean, was, was came up after a, much like he did today, came up after a worship session, and he was talking about, I think it must have been around um, uh, uh, Easter time, but he's talking about the sacrifice that Christ gave. And, and I think he kept using that term, and it kind of stuck with me, and I was always like, man, what, what a great concept, you know? We, we think about all the things that Jesus has given us. We think all the things that God has blessed us with, all the abundance of riches, all the things that we are not even deserving of, even close, Okay, and I think he gave all these things, and I began to be uh, look back into my own life and say, "Okay, Luke, he's gave all these things to you. Now, what about you? Now, what have you given to God? What are you willing to put on the sacrifice? What are you willing to take to the altar of God and say, take it all, Lord, because it's all yours anyway?" And I, and I really had to think about this, and, and uh, so I was in Numbers, and I'm studying the scriptures in Numbers, and I'm thinking, here's this story of, of, of the ultimate giving, right? And, and, and I'm, we're going to go to number 16, but I want to catch you up to where we are going to start. We're going to start in number 1641. Um, before this, if you go to 161, I encourage you to read this tonight. And get your Bibles out if you have them. We're going to do some flipping around today, which is, which is good. We need to do that. I don't have them all on the slides. I'm not giving them all to you for free. Don't think you're just going to get them all spoon-fed to you. You're going to work today. And uh, I was, um, number 16.1 starts with this story. We've all heard of it, Korah's Rebellion. Okay, it's where Korah and all the other, uh, there, there were some other men of repute, they called them, I believe, men of honor in the Israelite community. And they thought, you know what? Here's Moses and Aaron, and they think that they're up here. They think they're just better than everybody else. Well, we think everybody should be equal. We think that we should have that same honor. So they go in to the temple and they start offering incense on the altar. Now this was just for Aaron. This was just for Aaron and his family. It was not for anyone else. And they go in and offer these sacrifice, these, this incense offering and God is furious. And God says, Moses, you get away from this assembly because I'm wiping them all out. We're starting fresh. And Moses said, don't, don't take them all for one man's sin. We see this first in, in, instance of, of Moses' real intercession for the people. And um, so Korah and his family are now uh, under judgment of God. Fire comes down from heaven and consumes up the 250 men that did the sacrifice. Not only that, the earth opens up later 
in the same chapter, this has to be one of the most action-packed chapters in the entire Bible, right? Then the earth opens up, consumes their families right into the earth. And I think the text, I believe, says everybody went running. They all went running and shouting and screaming. And I just, I just kind of see um, this uh, almost, you hate to say, comical, you know, running away like you see on the cartoons where they're just running from this um, devastation. And here is Moses and Aaron. And this is where we pick it up. This just happened, saints. Fire from heaven. The ground opened up and swallowed people. If that happened now, you would be shocked. And this is what happens. The next day, note that it took one day for what we're going to talk about to transpire. The next day, the whole Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And they said, you have killed the Lord's people. It took one day. How often do we have forgiveness from God and it takes us one day to go back to the filth, to go back to the nonsense that we did before. One day it took these rebellious people to turn back to their old ways of grumbling and complaining. Here Moses and Aaron had put their life on the line to lead these people out of bondage, into deliverance and freedom, and then ultimately into inheritance, and they had to pick a bone with him. They had to have a problem. Let me tell you, that is what you're up against. You are up against a world that hates you. And anything you do to serve them, you are not going to get honor. If you're looking for a pat on the back in this life, you better find the next one because it ain't happening. All right, saints, let's first accept that premise. That you are not going to be honored in the flesh for what you're doing. You must honor God in obscurity. I think if we could grab that idea and grab onto it, I think we do a lot better. Because I think so often we're looking for public acclaim. I'm just talking to myself here, guys. Trust me, I'm not just pointing to you. This is me. This is something I reflect on. Um, Go back to that scripture there. Um, The next day, now, grumbled. They blamed them. God brought judgment on the people, and who did they blame? They blamed the people of God. And look what they did. They totally turned logic around. You have killed the Lord's people. For one, we know God did it. God brought judgment. But number two, they called those people the Korah's rebellion, the ones who went and offered incense um, without blessing, without that being their place. They called them the Lord's people. Go to the next slide real quick. I want to show you two things that go along with this. There we go. This is what Proverbs says about evil people. You are in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. And if you think they're going to understand what you're doing and what you're called to, you're missing it. Evil men do not understand justice. They do not understand correction. And when we have a culture that embraces everything under the sun, they do not understand what you're doing in your life to sacrifice, to give up, to put everything aside and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it fully. Are you seeking God? Because if you are, you'll understand God's justice fully. Go to the next one here. Isaiah gives us six woes. I think this is interesting. One of these woes says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. They put darkness for light, and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Are we not in this right now? Let me tell you something. It's been going on for 2,000 years, but we are in it right now. We are in a society, in a culture that tells us everything wicked is good and everything that is good is wicked. Why would you waste your time on that gospel? Why would you waste your time serving a book that, that's 2,000 years old and all these wonderful scholars have disproven it? Why would you waste your time on that? Why would you waste your time praising God looking like a fool? Because I'll be a fool gladly for Christ's sake. Man, we've got to give it all to him. Go to, this is not a cheater one. You're going to have to look it up. Go to Titus. I want to take you to Titus chapter one. I'm going to tell you what's going on right now. I feel like a watchman, guys. You know what they said? Those watchmen, they talk to each other at night. 
Because at night they couldn't see from tower to tower. Those watchmen had to verbally tell things that were going on. And I'm here as a warning. I'm here as a, as a, as, as a watchman on the wall. I can see the horizon. I see what's coming. And we need to understand justice. But we got to understand that today we have to put our, our house in order. Okay, that's really what I'm going to get to. I really want to get to, we have to put our house in order and give everything to God so that he can prepare us for what's going to be coming in the land. All right? Titus chapter 1, verse 15, we're going to start. Unto the pure, all things are pure. I'm reading out of the King James now, so I'll make you King Jamesers happy. Um, I got to throw one in there or I'll get booed off. Um, But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. These unbelievers, nothing is pure. Now remember, these are also people who profess to know God. This is not just the pagan man that has nothing to do with the Lord. This also includes those who are in churches right now this morning. All right? There are some included in this group. Listen to what he says. They profess that they know God. But in works, they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and to every good work reprobate. They profess to know God, but in their works, they deny him. How many times do we see that? How many times like Korah's rebellion? The next day, they went back to the old ways. Don't leave here and go back to your old ways. Wake up. Wake up from your slumber, as it says in in, in Ephesians. Come into the light. Step into the glorious presence of Jesus Christ. Give it all to him and let him rule and run your life. That's our, that is our blessing. We cannot fall into this trap where we go back to our old works. We become unfit. He said unfit for doing anything good. You can't even do good, guys. If we continue in corruption, you cannot do good. I didn't say it. The scriptures declare it. Oh, there is a, there is a standard we have to live by in the land. Go to the next one here. I want to keep going. I don't have a lot of time, but I want to, I want to get through this, and it's quite a bit to uh, cover. Okay, next one. But, but when the assembly gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron uh, and turned towards the tent of meeting, suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. This, this happened the first time too. And here it's happening again. So I'm building this story. I want to build this up to this point so I can drive to this question. The whole assembly is gathered. Let me tell you something. What are you going to do when it's you alone? What are you going to do when you're standing by yourself against the ways and corruptions of the world? What are you going to do when everyone else is going this way and God tells you, no, 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 son, I called you to go that way? Because here, the whole assembly now, now it has grown into a a big problem for Moses and Aaron. And Moses and Aaron are thinking, okay, because we do this. Everybody's displeased. I must have done something wrong. We start to question ourselves. Is God really with me? Has God's glory left me? Has he removed his candlestick from my life? Because all this is going on, what do I do now? And I want to show you what they did. They turned toward where? The tent of meeting. Because they had to get with God. They had to get serious with God. You notice it doesn't say they went running to, oh, so-and-so over here, what do you think I should do? And they're running over here, what do you think I should do? I'm probably number one to blame for that. We go to every counselor in the flesh and we don't go to the tent of meeting to get serious with God and let him start pruning some things out of your life. What has he got to cut out of your life? Moses is thinking, all right, I am done going to the people. I'm done going to those that I'm trying to bring into blessing. I am going to God. I am going to the source. If you want life, go to life. If you want water, go to water. Quit seeking everything else from every other little ancillary object. 
and go straight to God. And they went to the tent of meeting and the cloud cover it because God arrived, saints. And when God arrives, it's business time. We've got to get serious and we've got to get into this place. And when we come here, not that this place or building or, or, or anything special about the facility, but it's the people that God dwells in. It's the people that come together hungry for his presence and we need to get into his presence and experience what God is telling us because his glory will appear. Next slide, please. Oh, wait, I want to go one scripture first. You can go to the next slide anyway. Psalm 27, 5, if you have your Bible, I want you to go here. This is a Psalm of David. David believed the same thing. That when things get tough, when that world is coming against you, when the enemy is bringing railing accusation against you, and I'll be honest, guys, I've been going through things. The enemy will start to hammer at you time after time after time and then you get up and he comes back and he hits you again and he takes your legs out again and you get up and he takes your legs out again. You've all been there and maybe you're there now. Maybe you feel like I'm just getting back up and here comes the enemy again. Where are you going? Where are you going today? Are you going to um, feed yourself with with things of the flesh to distract you maybe. It's tempting. It really is. Boy, it's tempting. Oh man, there are things that I'd love to do and just sit and let my mind go and just get away from it all. But David knew and Moses knew and they're good enough for me to take after. David said, for the time of trouble, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Do you want to get your feet under you? Do you feel blindsided? Do you feel like you just can't stand up sometimes? Get into his tabernacle. Get into that place where you can get serious with God, where he can speak to you. David Wilkerson talked about have a place, have a prayer closet, have something you can go and be alone with God because there's things he'll tell you that he can't tell anybody in your life. He won't even tell your spouse, but he's got to reveal them to your heart. And he can't do that in the noise because he's not interested in competing with your cell phone. Sorry to tell you. Or your television. Or your video games. But he is interested in speaking to your heart because that is where change happens. It doesn't happen up here. It happens in here. And until we get our eyes focused on Jesus, get into the tent of assembly and be humbled by his presence, you're not going to hear from him. You're not. Then Moses went in front of the tent of meeting and the Lord said to Moses, get away from this assembly so I can put an end to them at once. Yeah. I think there are a lot of us that if God told us this about people in our lives or enemies we have, that we would probably stand back and go, okay. Oh, okay. Amen back there. Give say amen to me. <laughs> Um, I, I'm the same way. There's times we would go, you know what, Lord? They deserve it. They have it coming. Let them go. Not Moses. <laughs> I think about, I don't know why, I was sitting here praying, and I, I thought about a guy. Um, it was a family that I had helped years ago. And, uh, man, I, I remember I did, a, I did a Bible study at Crossroads. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, him and his wife, and they said, hey, we want to know the Bible like you. We want to know the scripture like you. I thought, that's great. All right, let's get in the word. So started doing these Bible studies and they had disaster after disaster and calamity after calamity happen in their life. And every time I would go and I would encourage them and I would be there for them, whether it be financial or they needed a ride or they needed advice or they needed to get, you know, uh, get a job or whatever. I'd advocate for them and help them. And I literally put everything out there for them. And they moved away one day. And before they were moving, they had this horrible car. I got to tell this little side story. They had this car. I was like, there is no way you're going to make it to North Dakota, let alone Grand Island. (laughs) 
Hallelujah. Oh, man. I said, we're going to have to really anoint this car. So we had buckets of oil and we're just dousing. And you're like, you're going to slide there, if anything. And uh, so, we, so we go to this car and we're praying for this car. We're like, oh, hallelujah. I thought, Lord, this makes it. It's a miracle. And so I put in my miracle book because we all have a miracle book. And <laughs> so I'm praying. And he made it to North Dakota, right? Made it to Bismarck, North Dakota. Well, I didn't hear from him for a long time. And for some reason, the Lord had put on my heart this man and his family. And, and I still haven't, I've heard loosely from them. He's, he's gotten a hold of me via um, Facebook or some other things. And um, I remember talking to him after a while. This was many, probably a year after I'd been helping him a lot. And you know what he said to me? He said, he said I felt like you were lying to me the whole time. He said, I, he said, I don't, I don't even feel like you cared about us at all. You have any idea what it's like? <laughs> I'm sure you do. To serve someone to the utter end of yourself and have them go, I don't think you really even cared about me. Not one bit. And I think Moses was here. And I can relate to him. And I know you can too. But who are you serving? Really? Are you serving them or are you serving Jesus? And I don't know what's going to happen with this man and his family. But I got to think. I got to think that when God plants a seed, something's going to come up. It's easy to get discouraged, saints. Because like I said, if you're looking for a pat on the back, you're in the wrong field of work. You better go get a corporate gig because they love to pat you on the back. But if you want to serve God, you better get ready to suffer. You better get ready to get slapped around, even by the ones that you're trying to deliver. And here's Moses. And God says, get away because I'm taking them out and I'm done with it. And I don't want you to get... Uh, Moses advocates for him and defends him and I don't want you to get confused like, like God's this vicious person and Moses is standing. There's more to it than that. But I don't have time to get in there. But notice what Moses and Aaron do. They fell face down. Sometimes I think God hears us a whole lot better on our faces than he does on our feet. To me, when we get serious with God, there's no other place to be than on our face. There's no pride in that. There's no pride in sitting on your face, weeping in the presence of God and letting him just stroke your back and your head and saying, I've got you, saint. I've got you, son. Don't worry. I'm here for you. Because there's a peace that comes over you. And I think there's a peace that Moses and Aaron found. And they were on their faces before God, waiting for his outpouring at that moment. They said, God, I've done all I can. It's your show. Here's what happens. Go to the next slide. Sorry, I don't mean to sound bossy. (laughs) It's just natural for me. Hallelujah. Someone's got a boss, the guy controlling it. Okay. Then Moses says to Aaron, take your censer and put incense in it along with fire from the altar and hurry to the assembly to make atonement for him. Wrath has come out from the Lord and the plague has started. Okay. So when you're faced in those situations like I just talked about, where the culture has turned you away, your friends have turned you away, the ones you're helping have turned you away and spurned you and said, I really don't think you're even in this for for anything godly. Then what do you do? Here's what Moses and Aaron did, and I think we can take some instruction from this. Moses told Aaron, take your censer. Now remember, this is what started the brouhaha in the first place, okay? Was the incense burning. 
This incense burning was for one place and one place only. If you go back to Exodus, it was only meant for the Holy of Holies. The incense burning was meant that the incense would fill the tabernacle. All you would smell is the incense. You would never see the burning incense. You would smell it. Now here, Moses is saying, okay, Aaron, I want you to take the incense and the censer and you go and you, um, you do it in front of them. You make it a display. Now, let me tell you this spiritually today. God is telling you to take your anointing from in the tabernacle and take it to the people. Okay? Take your censer. Hello, censers. These are the censers. Put incense in it. Incense is Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The fire is the Holy Ghost and fire through which you should be baptized. And if you're thinking now, I don't know what that is, then please come talk to us afterwards because you need to know what a Holy Ghost baptism is because it is real. I know we've gotten scared of it and there's things about it that people have corrupted that I don't agree with, but there is absolutely a baptism of Holy Ghost and fire. And when that comes upon you, everything changes. And here is Moses telling Aaron, you take the vessel and you be a symbol to these people that Christ dwells among his saints. And he's telling you that today too. Don't come in here and just leave it in here. Don't let people just smell what's going on in here. Don't let people just see it from outside and say, I can see it from a distance, but I'm not really quite sure what that church is all about. No, no, no. He said, you go and you put it in front of them. You be the sacrifice. You be the atonement. Atonement for them. That even though they hate you, even though they revile you, even though they despise you, you are the atonement for them. Because ultimately, above all those things, they need to know that you love them. Even though they hate you. Maybe because they hate you, you love them more. Hurting people hurt people, right, Jessica? That's a, that's a, that's a, a counselor's term there. That's, that's the way it is. Hurting people hurt people. Let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to show you what Paul says about this. Because Paul caps on this. You guys, these are all symbols. These are all types and shadows. We don't have time to break all of them down now, but I guarantee you there's truth in all these things. Um, 2 Corinthians 2, 15. 2, 15. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. I think some of your translations might say an aroma or an incense. In them that are saved and in them that perish, to the one we are the savor of death unto death, and the other the savor of life unto life. I don't have time to get into all that. But and who is, I love where, what Paul says at the end here, and who is sufficient for these things? You know what he's saying? Who's cut out for this? Paul was serious, man. You look at Paul's life. Paul lived a life of sacrifice. And he's saying, we are to be a sweet smell. And I think he might have been thinking about this situation here where he said, who is cut out to go and make atonement for the ones that hate them? Who is cut out to go and give where everybody wants to take? If it is more blessed to give than to receive, then that really needs to be what we do. It has to be our lifestyle, not our talk, but our lifestyle. Because if you don't, then you are unfit, just like we talked about in Titus, for doing any good. You're not even fit for it. Take your toys and go home. Because God has called us to a standard. And Paul is saying, who is fit for these things? It's like Jesus when he goes out and he's, he's got all these people with him. And what does Jesus do when large crowds start coming, if you notice? He thins them out pretty quick. <laughs> he's like, I don't think you guys should be here. You need to go and you need to go. Oh, by the way, if you don't want to sell all your possessions and get out of here. And, 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 you know, I mean, he was not the best preacher we would think on non fleshly terms, right? I mean, he did not have big crowds. And when they did come, he said, get out of here. Because who is sufficient? Who is fit for these things? You're not, but Christ in you is. Let me tell you something. You can't do these things out of your own flesh. It's got to be Jesus. Okay, let me get through here because I got I to gotta hustle. 
Okay, go to the next one. Um, okay, so Aaron did as Moses said. I love this. I love this scripture, okay? And Aaron did as Moses said, and he ran into the midst of the assembly. I, you know, we go, we go when God calls us, but it's like this. Are you sure? What? Did you say something? What, Lord? Okay. What? And you know, what did Aaron do? Aaron ran into the midst of the assembly because he knew times were grievous. He knew things were serious. Boy, if you don't hear the groaning of creation now, you wouldn't know that things are serious. It is serious business right now. People are in misery. People are bound. People are in chains. People are in corruption. There is a whole host of individuals who are just following this path that leads to perdition. And unless we run into the midst of them, you're not going to be able to make any difference. Notice what it says here. This is a very key word. It says midst. That's not a typo. It does not mean mist. Midst. Midst. Into the middle of them. I'm not going to go there, but if you want to, go to Ezekiel 37, where Ezekiel has this vision, right, of the bones and of the valley. And, and God takes him and he puts him not outside the valley, not over here on a hill, not to overlook it, not to scan it. He didn't do it fly by in the midst. Put him right in the middle of the bones. Where has God put you? Because if this is it, this is not a gathering of you in the midst of those who hate you, of the midst of the community of Israel that was turned against God. This is not, this is not it. It's out there. And God is not calling you to walk there. He's calling you to run there. He's calling you to go with everything you have. And even when they hit you and they hit you and they knock you down again, you get up and you make atonement for them anyway. Because it's not our job to judge. And that's why we said at the beginning in Proverbs, if the wise understand judgment. They understand justice. And we understand it's God's show and not ours. We're not here to carry out justice. God is. The plague had already started among the people, but Aaron offered the incense and made atonement for him. This plague is sweeping through the camp. And Aaron goes into the midst of the plague. He put his life on sacrifice. He put everything out to God and said, if I die from the plague, Lord, so be it. You've called me to do this. If I go out this way, so be it. Do this. I'm doing it. If I go broke for the ministry, so be it. All right? I'm okay with that. My wife's not, but I am. And I'm totally okay with it, as long as she keeps working. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, hallelujah. I'm going to pay for that one later. Um, see, I'm just thinking about a way to get myself out of it now. Um, we have got to give everything we have. He gave everything. It's our turn. All right? He already did the sacrifice on the cross. That's done. We... we we get to the cross, but we don't move on. You, you, know, you know, we take the sacrifice and we take all the benefits and we leave all the work to, to others. And Jesus said it. Man, the harvest is plentiful, but I don't have any laborers. Like, there's only so much, only so much that some of these guys can do, especially me. Uh, he's looking at me going, he can't do hardly anything right. <laughs> So what's the next slide there? I don't even know where I'm at right now. So just go to the next slide. We'll just take it. He stood between the living and the dead and the plague stopped. He stood between the living and the dead. There was one other. There was one other. And Aaron is the type and shadow of him that was to come, that was to stand just like this between the living and the dead. He stood between one man who repented of his ways and became one of the living and one man who remained in his ways and was the dead and in between him was the crucified Christ. If we are to be like Christ, then we have to be like that. We have to sacrifice and stand between the living and the dead. Now God's called us to these things. God has put a standard. Um, what's the next one in there? I don't even know what's up next. Okay. 14,000 people died from the, 14,700 people died from the plague. That's a lot of bodies. That's a ton. You got to think. I mean, that is, that, I, I'm, just, I'm just in awe. Hastings has 24,000 people. 
if 14,000 died, there'd be some, now, there would be some noise about it. 14,700 people died from the plague in addition to those who had died because of Korah. So this is not including those. Um, then Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance of the tent of meeting and the plague stopped. This is the end of the chapter. I don't know about you guys, but it feels very anticlimactic, right? I feel like, I feel like Aaron kind of walks back to the temple, there's bodies everywhere and takes the incense and thunks it up there. Hey, Moses. <laughs> like, like, really? What is going on here? I think everything would stop. But here, they just, it's over. He goes and sees Moses and he says, all right, we did the job. We did it. That was it. That was, that was what we were supposed to do. The whole purpose was to sacrifice for the people. The, pl- the plague stopped. You guys, there's a plague in the land. You guys can come out, worship team, and, 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 and get rolling here in a second. I only have one more thing to go through. There's a plague in the land. And God's calling each and every one of you to go into the midst of the assembly and stand in where the plague is wreaking complete havoc. I read a statistic the other day. In the UK, 70% of prostitutes come from foster care. Do we have a plague in the land? Or am I just thinking things? Do we have a drug problem in Hastings? Or am I just out of my mind? And God's brought these things onto my heart. And he said, you know what, Luke? I gave everything for you. I'm asking you to give something. I say this whole message to tell you one thing. We're in serious times. And it takes serious people to battle serious times. You don't send your weakest warrior into battle. You send the ones God has fit for it. And I have something that I think that I, I, I don't know how to say it. I want to do, I, 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 I want to make a habit of this. I know we fast at the beginning of the year. I'm not calling us to another fast. Some of you are thinking, thank God. <laughs> they do the free Big Mac thing on Sundays, right? So <laughs> can't miss that. Um, but we have got into a culture that loves cheap grace. We love the idea of receiving what God has done, but we hate the idea of giving back to God what he's done for us. We hate it. Now I'm asking you something. I want you to grab, if you want, you don't have to, of course. I can't make you do anything. <laughs> But I want to pray with all of you. I want to turn this into a prayer meeting. I want to stir up some things. If there's something in your life, and there's some people out here, you know there's things in your life. I'm not talking about sins. I'm not talking about sins. I'm talking about things that you blatantly know are taking your time away from God. Are taking your focus away from God. They're distracting you from the battle. And I want you, I'm not going if to, you, if you want, I want you to write it down and bring it up here. And I, we're just going to pray. Somebody will come and pray with you. We got, we got great men and women of prayer right up here. We want to pray with you. Because there is a plague in the land. And if you want to stop it, then you've got to give some things up. Ezekiel 14 says, my people, they've served all, idol, all these idols. And he said, I, the Lord, will answer them according to the idols in their heart. You see, once it becomes a part of you guys, God just lets you keep going. In. He starts to answer you according to your idols. That's scriptural. So I'm telling you, we need to cut things out. Rip them from you. And if it doesn't hurt, then it's probably not worth taking out. Not because, not because you depend on it, not because God depends on it, but because the community of Israel, those who have fallen away, depend on you. And if you don't write yourself, you're no good to anyone else. 
So I want the worship band, they can come out and play this song. I asked them to play, we have plenty of time, to play the last song again. Not the last song, Christ is Enough. Go to the next slide real quick. I do want to read this. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of my favorite writers. If you ever get a chance to read the book, The Cost of Discipleship, you grab it and do it. This is what he said. It, meaning discipleship, is nothing else than bondage to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ alone. Completely breaking through every program, every ideal, every set of laws. No other significance is possible. No other significance is possible. Since Jesus is the only significance. Can we let that reign in our hearts today? Beside Jesus, nothing has any significance. He alone matters. He alone. Is he worth that thing that you know is distracting you from his holy presence? Because we all want the outpouring, but we don't want the sacrifice. Learn to serve him in obscurity. I want to pray with you. We're just going to let them play this song and just worship God. And, 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 and uh, if you're okay, brother, can we just end it like that, however it goes? I just want to let God move. Let's just let the spirit stir. And I got to say, God's doing something in you through this sabbatical. And I, I, I brother, love it. So I, I'm, I'm thrilled for what's coming here. But you know what it's going to take? If we really want to be plague stoppers, we got to cut some things out. We got to give. He gave, what about you? What are you willing to give up? What are you willing to say, all right, Lord, I've had enough. I've had my fill. I've had my fill. I'm done. It's all about you, not sins, things that are distracting you. I'm going to leave it at that. So if you want to do that, we're going to take the cards and we're just going to throw them. We're not even going to look at them. So if you want to write it, I think it's good to write something to have something physical and tangible. We're not going to look at it. I don't care. It's between you and God. If you want to do that, I want to pray with you. If you want to get serious, if you want to get serious about what God's doing in the hearts of men, then I want to pray with you.